Welcome to the June 27th, Tualatin City Council meeting. Welcome again for uh, it's a hot evening. And uh, thank you for taking some time out tonight to join us. Uh, first thing we're going to do tonight is our Pledge of Allegiance, led by Councilor uh, Grimes. I'm um, not Councilor Grimes, Councilor's. Ooh, tough day. It's been too hot today. Councilor Pratt. Thanks for the compliment. Um, please, <laughs> please place your hand over your heart and um, follow me the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Council Pratt. Uh, next up is our public health announcement led by Council Brooks. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I Tonight, I just want to share some good news. Um, we are state ranked fourth in the entire country as far as um, saving lives during COVID. So I wanna put a special thank you out to uh, you, Mayor, and our city manager for the leadership um, in this city and to all of our citizens for um, following safe practices and taking care of each other by doing all the things that we did and have our continue to do like getting our vaccines and wearing our masks and social distancing. And also just encourage people now that um, vaccines are available for children under five, that we can get the last um, vulnerable people that are still uh, more likely to catch the virus um, vaccinated and reduce our community spread even more. Um, and just, I know there's a lot of people that are sick right now. Luckily, they're not on ventilators in the hospital, but I know they're sick around town. And so I just also want to say, um, hoping everybody has a speedy recovery with very little complications during this time. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I am number two tonight is a fireworks safety announcement led tonight by Chief Pickering. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, good evening, Council and those in attendance. So we finally have seen a, a stretch of some warm, dry weather. Uh, so I'm sure many are excited to get outside and celebrate the upcoming holiday this coming up weekend or next week. So uh, over the last three years, the Oregon State Fire Marshal has reported uh, 1,173 fires related to fireworks, which is equated to a roughly $4.9 million in damages. So fireworks are still a problem in, in this state. So, you know, fireworks that are purchased locally are legal. Uh, and the, the rules uh, in Oregon say that if, uh, fireworks that fly, explode, that travel more than one foot in the air or six feet over the ground are illegal. And those only come from some places uh, outside of the state of Oregon. So we don't want people to be tempted to uh, drive to the north and, and spend some money and, and bring that stuff uh, into our area. So uh, it is a Class B misdemeanor, which can carry up to a $2,500 fine if you're caught with with uh, illegal fireworks in the city. Uh, the 4th of July is typically a very, very busy night for the police department. It's one of our busiest days. Uh, and not only for us, but for our dispatch center. Uh, so they, they are typically inundated with calls that night uh, and have to do their best to prioritize. So we wanna remind people not to call 911 for fireworks related incidents, unless there is a fire or, or, or any type of dangerous situation. Uh, we ask that you call the non-emergency number through the Washington County Dispatch Center, which is 503-629-0111. And most of all, we want everybody to get out and have a safe and legal 4th of July holiday. So thank you, Mayor. Thanks, Chief. All right. Uh, next up, we have a couple employee introductions. The first introduction would be from uh, Susan Tyler. Mayor and Council, good evening. I'd like to introduce Ed Jones. Ed comes to us from the city of Gresham where he worked for uh, seven years. And prior to that, he worked actually directly under me at Washington County for about 12 years. And uh, we're very excited to have Ed as a part of our, um, our building division team as our senior plans examiner. Uh, in Ed's spare time, he likes to work on cars, Mustangs in particular. And, uh, and he plays the guitar very well too. And so with that, I'd like to introduce Ed to say a few words. Hello, council. This is me. 
I appreciate, uh, appreciate you uh, checking in on employees coming in. And I am so far, it's been really great experience. Very welcoming group, um, and it's so far a great team. I'm pretty impressed. When did you start? 16th of May. All right, all right, all right. Okay, cool. Well, welcome to the city. Uh, you get to enjoy the new uh, city operations center, I assume, in uh, it's all new glory. So I'm glad that uh, you joined our team here. Um, yep. As you've already been told, uh, both the city employees had a front facing to our residents. People, our residents love our city employees, um, very well respected, and that uh, they appreciate the work and the amount of effort uh, city employees put into everything they do here in Tualatin to make it a beautiful place to live. And welcome team. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Our next new employee introduction is going to be from Kim McMillan. Welcome, Kim. Good evening, Council. Uh, tonight, I want to introduce our newest engineering tech to Chris Kwiatkowski. I'm going to practice his name, Kwiatkowski. Um, Chris comes to us from the Sunrise Water District, and he did a short stint in West Lynn, and we're so happy to have him. He has uh, three associate's degrees, I believe, related to water distribution, wastewater, and water treatment. And he grew up in Orange County. He plays the bass guitar and has turned toured with bands, so I'm seeing something in CD, you know, some kind of a band happening here. And he will be doing the plan review and inspection on private development and capital jobs in Tualatin. So very excited to have him on board. He's going to be the guy out at Autumn Sunrise, making sure they hold it to our plans and codes. Well, welcome, Chris. Uh, how are you wearing a hat today? <laughs> Uh, I'm actually bald, so I'm constantly wearing a hat. <laughs> oh, sorry. I'm like, oh man, I'm sweating. You got a, got a uh, toque on there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, the the AC is blasting in my house right now. <laughs> All right. Well, welcome. You want to have uh, anything to say to introduce yourself? Um, I just I appreciate uh, you guys giving me the opportunity. Um, so far, I've been here about a month, a little over a month now, and it seems like a great place to work. Um, it's a welcome breath of fresh air from my last two places of employment. <laughs> oh, terrific. I'm glad to hear that, that uh, we have raised the bar and uh, hopefully you're going to be a long term employee and retire from the city of Walton. So welcome. Yeah, I look forward to it. Thank you. All right. Our next item up is our Pride Month proclamation led tonight by Councillor Sacco. Thank you. Um, I just want to take a moment before I read the proclamation to acknowledge um, that uh, we had a couple youth representatives that came and spoke at our last council meeting. Um, and they were definitely pivotal in, in this process along with um, another community member. So I just want to acknowledge that, um, you know, we as a community and our individual community members, um, we, we really do um, value everything that's in this proclamation. And um, I feel it was kind of a labor of love um, with um, multiple people coming together um for this effort so i just want to say thank you and i wanted to acknowledge those folks so um declaring june 2022 to be pride month in the city of tualatin whereas the city council's 2030 vision is for tualatin to be an inclusive community that promotes equity diversity and access and creating a meaningful quality of life for everyone and whereas Tualatin is a community that includes values and welcomes diversity in our community, including diversity of sexual orientation and identity. And whereas we recognize, support, and appreciate the valuable contributions of the members of the LGBTQIA community. And whereas the month of June is internationally recognized by the LGBTQIA plus community to commemorate the Stonewall Uprising in New York City 
in response to incessant police harassment and discriminatory laws that have since been declared unconstitutional. And whereas many LGBTQIA plus members continue to face harassment and physical violence, and LGBTQIA plus members are four times more likely to experience violent victimizations that non-community members, including 57 gender non-conforming murders in 2021. And whereas LGBTQIA plus youth are almost five times as likely to have attempted suicide compared to straight cisgender youth. And each episode of LGBTQIA plus victimization, such as physical or verbal harassment or abuse, increases the likelihood of self-harming behavior by two and a half times on average. And whereas we remain steadfast in our dedication to eliminate the prejudice and discrimination faced by members of the LGBTQIA plus community, and whereas we speak, we seek to amplify the voices of the LGBTQIA plus community, including youth, allies, and student groups, such as Tualatin High School's Gay Science and Hazelbrook Middle School's Aqua Club. And whereas we believe that the rich diversity of communities in Tualatin is one of our greatest strengths. Now, therefore, be it proclaimed by the City Council of the City of Tualatin, Oregon, that June 2022 is Pride Month in the City of Tualatin. The community is encouraged to respect and honor our diverse community, celebrate, and build a culture of inclusivity and accepted. Introduced and adopted this 27th day of June, 2022. All right, thank you, Councilor Sacco. Uh, that brings us to public comment. This is an opportunity for anyone to address the council regarding something that's not on tent agenda. Please keep your comments to about three minutes. If there's anyone in the Zoom meeting who would like to uh, make a public comment, you can do so now. So maybe Hi, thank you, Mr. Hold. Mayor. How are you? Good, my name is Fernando Navarro. Thank you for having me here. I really appreciate you giving me the time to speak a little bit. I um, has been living here for Latin for like a 20 years, and then, uh, especially in Las Casitas for 10 years, and I want to make uh, my community uh, the cleanest, the better, and uh, uh, thank you to the uh, Chief Craig for having a meeting with me before you right now. I uh, used to uh, make some concerns about the cleaning of the streets in my community, the parking space and uh, the parking all, all around Casitas, the lighting. And then uh, I have been working with Betsy, with the Consul Reyes, like for around three to five years already. And then I uh, thank you for having me again on the city of Palatine, working for making better city. Okay. So, saying that we need a little help on, on, on my community, especially because uh, I, I see a lot of abandoned cars and then uh, speeding, kind of racing at night size. So if uh, talking to Chief Greg, uh, we can go ahead and have a, a little plan to make this place a little more better than okay. what it is right now. All right, so you've reached out to the Chief and how about to uh, folks as far as the street lighting, we talked to are Public Works folks yet? Yes. Okay. Uh, and what what uh, community are you in? What part of Tualatin? Because I remember you saying in Stone Ridge. Okay, Stone Ridge. Okay, thank you. I might have missed. Sorry. All right. Another. All right. And again, and so you're you working. You've been tonight. working with Betsy and Council Reyes too. Yes. Okay. All right. Council Reyes. Yeah, I just want to add that um, some of the things that. I think Fernando's trying to uh, also convey the message is that um, we might need a little bit more lighting in the area. We need okay. um, Republic Services or whoever does the cleaning to be a, uh, aware of what's happening there. And um, this, this just just to be more, more um, 
I think it's a little darker, dark in the area, and there's been some vandalism in the area. So if we can always look at having more patrolling and um, I, th I think that's the message that we're trying to convey. And, and of course, Republic Services making sure that they uh, announce or, or give us notice of what, you know, how, how to properly put tr trash away and clean up the area. Okay. All right, because we can work with our city manager and with city staff to see what we can do to get those things happen for you. Yeah, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. The other thing is, uh, it is a lot of few abandoned cars in there. I don't know what, what we can do really about it. I think Chief will probably have some ideas. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you so much again. Oh, thank you for taking time out tonight. I very much appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, is there anyone else who would like to make public comment? There is no other public comment. Well, Bates is echoing. Woo. <laughs> All right. Going once, going twice. All right. Uh, that moves us on to consent. These are items that are considered routine. They will be adopted by one motion unless someone on the council would like an item removed and heard separately later tonight. Consent agenda consists of six items tonight. Item one, consideration of approval of the work session and regular meeting minutes of June 13th, 2022. Item two, consideration of resolution number 5620-22, approving and authorizing provision of workers' compensation insurance coverage to volunteers of the city of Tualatin. Item three, consideration of resolution number 5621-22, authorizing personnel services, personal services updates for non-representative employees for fiscal year 22-23. Item number four, consideration of resolution number 5626-22, authorizing changes to the fiscal year 2021-2022 at the budget. Item number five, consideration of resolution number 5627-22, amending the city of Tualatin fee schedule and rescinding resolution number 5554-21. And finally, item number six, consideration of resolution number 5629-22, amending water, sewer, stormwater, road, and parks utility fee rates in the city of Tualatin and rescinding resolution 554-021 and 557-21. Would anyone like an item taken off consent tonight and heard later? I'll make a motion to approve the consent agenda as read. Thank you, Mayor. Okay, okay I have a motion and a second. Any discussions on the motion? Councilor Sacco. Aye. Councilor Hillier. Aye. Councilor Brooks. Aye. Councilor Pratt. Aye. Councilor Reyes. Yes. Councilor President Grimes. Aye. I, uh, I vote aye also. It's unanimous. That brings us to special reports. Tonight we have our annual report from the Tualatin Historical Society. And I think Ross is going to introduce our two illustrious leaders of the Historical Society. I see his name there. Ross. The other Ross. I, I, I think you I introduce myself. <laughs> okay, so Ross, I, so I've, you're doing the introduction, you're gonna take Ross, have Ross Baker take it away. Thank you, yeah, uh, thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Councillors. Yeah, we are joined tonight by Ross Baker of Tualatin Historical Society. So we have a presentation that I will share and uh, go ahead and take it away, Ross Baker. Okay, thanks. Well, uh, Ross Hoover is firing that up. I just want to get the word out to the new employees, Ed Jones, who plays guitar, by the way, and Chris Kwiatkowski, who plays the bass. Uh, we'll need some musician, musicians for our Heritage Evening in September, so maybe yeah. their uh, manager, Susan Tyler and Kim McMillan, can get word to them, and uh, we'll get some inside uh, music, but okay, that's an action item for me. Uh, it was a pretty good year. I'm going to go through the presentation pretty crisply. I'll pause for a couple of seconds at the end of each slide if you want to ask a question. We'll move on. Okay, Ross? Um, this is part one of two slides. First, the good news, and then I'll cover some of the bad news. We got the programs happening with regularity. I'll touch on that a little bit later. Newsletter never missed a beat. We got that out quarterly and all kinds of good things in there, including some new things that we've added. 
uh, like Tualatin 101, where we cover some of the basics of Tualatin history, and also a new thing we're doing called Walking Through Time. If someone finds a historic landmark or a building or something and they kind of take a selfie with it, we'll feature them in the newsletter. Uh, we'll talk about the history of what they took a photograph of and also give them a free membership. Uh, Heritage Evening is back. I'll mention that some more later. Rentals are starting back up again. That's our largest source of revenue and uh, that's going pretty well for us. Um, the Heritage Center was awarded a Backyard Habitat Silver Certification. If you're not familiar with that certification, the uh, Audubon Society um, in conjunction with the Columbia, uh, um, I was gonna say wastewater, but that's not the right term, the Columbia- Land uh, Trust. Somebody will help me, Bridget, you're gonna help Land, me? Yeah, Columbia Land Trust. Thank you, Columbia yep. Land Trust. I appreciate the assist. Um, and we're really proud of that. That's on display there. And we're doing a lot of things out in our garden to make that possible. Okay, now I'll go to part two, uh, sad things. We canceled Pioneer Days three days in a row. This for the fourth graders, you know, but this is typically held in June. So the pandemic just kind of got started and then never really was quite clear enough. So we caught three school years. We're working on a revised version of the Pioneer Days. Um, and we really believe that that'll be up and going. We've had a lot of uh, requests from local fourth grade teachers to actually send out material to them as well in the meantime, and we've worked with them. Uh, unfortunately, Cindy Frost, our manager for uh, five, six years, resigned in December, and um, I'll talk about the new center manager before we're done today, but a lot of you knew Cindy and all the great work she had done for us. Um, <clears throat> uh, we did have a drop in our membership, we, during the pandemic, we kind of waived the membership thing. If people didn't want to pay, we kind of kept them on thinking that, you know, it's tough times for everybody, but maybe they did want to quit after all, because we had a kind of a drop. Those that were, were waived were largely the reason why uh, we didn't get a renewals uh, when we went out, but the numbers are solid. I'm talking about six or seven members. Nonetheless, it's a, it's a negative drop. Um, and we had members that were unhappy with delays in our uh, BRIC program, getting them installed and stuff. And so that's all caught up now and they seem to be okay, okay? Uh, we're not gonna go through all these numbers obviously, but over on the left-hand side is the membership information. On the right-hand side, I think that what I needed to point out most importantly, this is only for three quarters because we're three days short of me being able to do a full year. Um, we're at 122% of budget. A lot of the revenue that was coming in during that time period it was already in like memberships and so forth. So that'll that'll end up the year a little bit less and the expenses through the year were 79% and that'll end up a little bit higher. But overall our revenue expenses will be in line and we're financially I think in pretty good shape. Okay, uh, here's some stuff. This is not too sexy, not too flashy but we're kind of proud of it uh, with archive rooms upstairs. If any of you have ever had a chance to see that, uh, it wasn't our proudest moment. It's now decluttered with new shelving. And it's amazing when you organize how much additional archive room you have. And we found out that we have quite a bit. And so we're very happy about that. We do have new inside outside chairs that we've got. The green ones that we had were very comfortable, but they were also 15 years old and kind of falling apart and very heavy. And some of our members, you can probably imagine the maybe the typical age of a, of a member, they just were not able to, to heft those anymore. So now we've got great chairs that provide us a lot more flexibility. We've got a new laptop. And if you have a chance to stop in before we change it over, because it'll be soon, we have a veterans display, including a slideshow uh, that we were very proud of that we did uh, during the celebration for uh, veterans um, during the month of May, okay? Um, I think our programming has really never been better. We're doing a lot of great job we, uh, of jobs, getting those out to the community. Uh, we still, of course, have our partnership with the Ice Age Floods Institute. Um, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but I think it's on the next slide. We also have a new partnership with um, a paleo group, a national paleo group. It is the North American Research Group, NARG. You may have heard of them. Um, and with their help, we're looking at August, we're, the details are not quite ready yet, but we're probably going to have a fossil fest out on the patio at the Historical Society. And of course, uh, that kind of fits right in with the whole Ice Age stuff. And okay, 
We're back in person on our programming. We'll just move ahead now, Ross. Um, we have a traveling trunk that we're working on. This is some stuff that's on the horizon, not quite ready. This is basically a suitcase we can take out to maybe other schools, for example, that would be interested in seeing a few items about uh, 12 since history. I already mentioned we're kind of re-envisioning pioneer days so we can get that going again. Uh, we're going to have a new note card series uh, for sale that Jenny Stout, one of our uh, board members, is working on. We do have a lot of heritage plants at the Heritage Center. And these will be watercolors featuring those plants at the center. I mentioned NARG, there it is. It was on that, um, uh, that foil. We're really proud to have them. They have their monthly meetings at our facility. And um, you'll be hearing more and more about them as we integrate some of their program into our calendar and stuff. We have online payment. I know it's not a big thing, but a lot of people actually want to pay with a credit card. For now, this is only for donations. But uh, we're taking it slow, making sure we're doing it right so people can pay with their um, for memberships and stuff also. Uh, third edition of Tualatin from the beginning, which is kind of our a Bible, is in the final stages of editing and um, should be out and printed uh, before this year is over with. And I already mentioned the whole walking through time thing that we now include not only in our newsletter, but it's also on the... Um, uh, on the web page as well. You can see the first two examples of people uh, kind of taking selfies with local things, okay? Um, we also like to celebrate the best of who we are. The uh, This past year, Brian Clopton got the President's Award. You may know may not know Brian directly, but you'll know him from his work. Um, he is the one who always ends up at this excavation company, moving those huge uh, glacier uh, glacial erratics around for the city and for us. And Al Stewart, uh, oh, Brian also is the one that restored that 1950-something Tualatin fire truck, which we had on display uh, last June. So he's done a lot of great things in the background. Uh, the Lafke Martinazzi Award, Al Stewart. Al is our photographer, and he just shows up everywhere, and we're so proud to have him. And um, he just does a lot of things for us for nothing, which is our favorite price. Our um, Jack Broom scholarship this year went to a young man. I had the pleasure of meeting Magnus Graham. Uh, there's more information about him on the webpage, and also there will be more information about him in our newsletter. Um, we're re really proud of the work the scholarship committee does um, with this uh, $3,000 scholarship. So that's, uh, you know, yay for us, okay? Uh, this is Rick, the new manager. If you haven't met him yet, pop in and say hi to him. I think you're going to like him. Uh, he's a really personable guy. He's been in Tualatin for 18 years. <clears throat> he's only the third manager we ever had. It's um, We didn't want to lose Cindy, but uh, between Lindy and Cindy and um, Rick, it's just the third person since 2006. So we've been fortunate in that department to not have a great turnover and always have great people. Uh, Ritz, Rick's got a bachelor degree in English, which I know I need because I make lots of typos and stuff. Um, he has a technology background, which is a big plus for us doing little things like that vet slideshow and other things and um, and just doing them and doing them right. So that's a big plus for us. Uh, so pop in and meet Rick. Uh, his email is manager at tualatinhistory.org. If you have a question or you know somebody that wants to rent the place, reach out to him. Okay. And this is, of course, the board members. I think they're all the same as last year. Yeah. Um, and the oh, last thing I want to mention is that our uh, picnic is our, our annual July picnic is Wednesday uh, after tomorrow, Wednesday, the 6th of July. I got to look at my calendar real quick. The 6th of July. It's in Community Park. Uh, we're going to have food there. Uh, we're going to have uh, an old friend of ours at the Historical Society, Dick Carmen of Reliving Radio. He's going to be playing music from the 50s, 60s, and 70s. He's also going to have some stuff on display. Uh, if you're kind of into antique radio and that kind of thing, he'll have a cool display there. And it would mean a lot to the members of the Historical Society and to me and to the board uh, just to have some representation from the console. Uh, also, uh, the people we interface regularly, Ross, uh, Julie, Tom, it'd be great to see you guys. Uh, anybody from the Parks and Arts Council, um, uh, committees rather, um, those are people who help us so much. 
And um, basically any city, city employee or anybody who volunteers for the city, uh, come on by and say hi and uh, buy something to eat from the taco truck. I'm done. Was there any questions for me? Questions for Ross. I see Councilor Rath's hand is up. What time is your picnic? Um, the, good question. I should have said that. Uh, the, the food will be served from like five to seven. People will start gathering and the music will start playing at 430. And by seven or 730, we're going to be, you know, kind of winding down. So I guess the answer to your question is 430 to 730 in that window. And do you really have 29 members that are over 90 years old? Yeah. That's amazing. Maybe you have a longevity connection there. You should study. Yeah. Well, you know, history <laughs> keeps you alive. It gives you something to live for. Yeah, no, they're great. And we cherish them. We send them birthday cards and it makes it, um, it makes it a fun challenge to make sure that we can find people to replace them too, when they decide that they um, don't want to participate anymore for whatever reason. And then my last thing is um, I'm really glad you're bringing back the pioneer days and the, um, I know several people that have been volunteers for that, and I have a friend that even comes back to town just to volunteer. So yeah, um, I think they have as much fun as the kids do. So I really am glad you're working on bringing it back. Yeah, we are. And I don't want to whine about volunteers. Everybody in this um, uh, Zoom conference has issues with, you know, to find volunteers and to make them happen. But we need to find a way to that we can do it without having to have 15 or 20 people there. Uh, and so uh, there's a lot of things we know, four or five biggest things that are real hits, like the land charters and the classroom. And I don't, don't want to get off on uh, too deep into the weeds on it, but uh, we have a committee working on it so that we can realize it with the resources that we have available. No questions for Ross. Councilor Brooks. Well, I just want to thank you for your leadership, Ross, and um, for being such a... Um, strong person in our community. And I have to say that when I, because I'm the council liaison to the Twelfton Arts Committee, Advisory Committee, there are uh, committee members that are such big fans of you and the Historical Society. And especially because of the art programs, and I'm just curious, you didn't cover them too much, but if you could share with us a little bit about those classes. The, uh, well, we have a, num a couple of classes. They're uh, painting classes. Um, they, um, you know, we, we need to get those on our calendar so you can see them, so the public can see those. Uh, but yeah, they're very well attended, and one lady has been with us for a number of years, and the other one's relatively new, and um, what I'll do is I'll just take the action tonight that we make sure we get those on our calendar so the public can see them. We have most of our programming on there, but I think that that would be a good thing. They're also good renters for ours, us, too, so it's a win-win, um, and um, yeah, thank you for saying so. Yeah, I understand the watercolor teachers are very well respected and they're really wonderful classes that are made available through there. And then the other thing that I just want to comment on was um, gratitude around the lifting up the, um, the backyard habitat program and the work that you do. I think the gardens, even if you can't get in through the gardens um, in the postcard project or the note card project just sounds um, wonderful. So thanks again for all you're doing. And hopefully I'll see you the, when is it? The day after tomorrow? Uh, uh, Wednesday, Wednesday, July the 6th. And um, the information is also on our webpage. And um, it's between like 4.30 and 7.30. Music, food, Sounds free, great. Free, free COVID test kits, all <laughs> kinds of great things. <laughs> Fabulous. Thank you. Other questions for Ross. Well, did you also mention where it was located? Sorry? Where the picnic's located. Did you say where Yeah, it was? it's Community Park, the main shelter. <laughs> I'm sorry. Right. You know, um, the thing is, is we want this, of course, we love to see people from the city there because we're so grateful for everything that that you do for us. And we get a stipend each year from you also. And Ross Hoover has been a great partner for us. And the thing is, though, for this picnic, we don't want to broadly publicize it um, to, to the, it's like for the members in the cities and stuff, because we do have a food truck there. That's, it's, it's something that's being done sort of to help us and to accommodate us and so forth. 
Um, so um, the the you'll, you'll find it on our Facebook page, for example, and you'll find it on our web page. But we don't make a big hoo ha in the community about the picnic. So um, we want it to be a nice, intimate event. It'll probably be I don't know, 50, 60, 70 people there, I, I guess. So it'll be fun. Okay. Uh, Councilor Reyes. Hi, Roz. How are you? Hi, Maria. Good. Thank you. Um, so I. I just, uh, pre-pandemic, you were, in, and just, um, I'm just curious what happened with this project. Um, you were recording people's hit, uh, life into Allerton or like, um, like you were recording like first generations or first people that were coming here. And then I think, uh, you know, at one point you were gonna record the stories and then, you know, they were gonna live in the library for a long time. And then people can come like their grandkids and listen to their story, to the I guess, you know, future <laughs> generations of back, you know, they're, whoever came to, to Tualatin first, did you ever uh, complete that? Do you still need more people for that? Or where was that project? It, um, I'm just curious what happened to that project. I don't know if you remember that, but. Oh, sure, sure. No, yeah. that's an ongoing thing. Oral histories are an ongoing thing for us. So the answer, did we complete it? No, we're never done. We always want to hear from anybody. We've just had a couple of recordings within the last few weeks. Um, but we do have on our webpage, we, we build a beautiful webpage and we have to now take the time and effort to move stuff onto the webpage. But if you go to the page and you find it in the drop down menu, you'll find oral histories. And if you go to the oral history page, you go down to the end, you can, you can click and go to our digital addict and you can actually, it's not so, it's not so pretty. What you're actually doing is you're going to a Google, Google drive page once you're out of the web. But you can see all of them we've done, including the ones that we did at Viva Tualatin a couple of years yeah. ago, mm -hmm. which were fascinating. And all of those are still residing. Most of our oral histories are still residing in Digital Addict. But if you go to our oral history page, go to the bottom and click it, you can go play around in there as time allows. Uh, we move more articles from our attic. We move more oral histories from our attic. We move, there's all kinds of fun stuff in there. Um, it just it takes the manpower to get it out there but more most importantly to your question if you know somebody um that we need to be talking to to mm -hmm. to get their story down we want to do it we've set up a regular time it's um the first tuesday of each month in the morning mm -hmm. is a set day where we set aside the heritage center to make sure we don't mm -hmm. have any rentals and we have a videographer or, or myself, sometimes I do it, sometimes um, uh, Mike from uh, Digipix does it, but we have fixed times and we really wanna fill all those slots uh, with uh, local people and their stories. Yeah, I remember I sent a couple of friends, that's why I was one, I, I wanna let her know, she asked me a couple of weeks ago, I just forgot about it, but I'm glad I saw you and I'll just let her know where to find her. Yeah. story have her email me president at uh tualatinhistory.org and I'll, okay. I'll connect her with our co-historians and we'll get it going okay thank you you bet all right any other questions for ross all right i just want to acknowledge larry mcclure is also on the zoom meeting here and you know larry's been a long time member and former leader of the historical society just want to acknowledge larry's work on the historical society with ross just say hello. Yeah, Larry's still a leader. That's where most of the work gets done is Larry. <laughs> Just a mouthpiece. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you for coming tonight, Ross. Okay. Thank you guys for the opportunity to brag. Okay. All right. That brings us to general business. I actually don't like that back. That brings us to public hearing. Uh, we now have a public hearing for consideration of resolution number 5630-22, adopting the City of Tualatin budget for the fiscal year commencing July 1st, 2022, making appropriations, levying ad valorem taxes, and categorizing categorizing the levies. And welcome, Mr. Hudson. Thank you, Mayor. Members of the Council, good evening. Uh, I won't repeat everything you just said. That was actually the start of my presentation, but you did such a fine job on that. I will just say that you have that resolution in front of you. Uh, Oregon statute. Do just one thing done. I got to officially open the hearing. Oh. Now, staff presentation. Proceed. Okay, I'll come back. Okay. <laughs> so, 
uh, revised Oregon revised stats require the council to adopt the resolution and the, the budget prior to July 1st, 2022 in order to continue operations. The proposed budget was approved by the 12th and Budget Advisory Committee on May 31st of this year. Uh, and in addition to the budget that was approved by the Budget Committee that evening, the City Council has the ability to change the approved budget by no more than 10% of the total budget in each fund. Staff is proposing three types of changes to the approved budget this evening. First, carryovers for items that were originally budgeted in the fiscal 21-22 budget, but will not be received or completed by, July, by June 30th. Second, increases in expenditures for items that have arisen since the fiscal year 2022-2023 budget was approved by the budget committee. And last, a transfer of existing appropriations in a fund to other categories, including creating new categories in that fund. So the first type of change that we're proposing this evening impacts the information services and the parks maintenance budgets in the general fund. In information services, there was budgeted for placement printers in the police vehicles in the amount of $15,260. They were anticipated to be received by the end of this fiscal year, but will not be received. So we're asking for that to be carried over. In the parks maintenance budget, in the parks restroom renovations project, some of the fixtures for those restrooms will not be received prior to June 30th. And we're asking for a $27,000 carryover in that budget. The second type of change will impact those funds that have personal services categories. Those include the general fund, the building fund, the water operating fund, the sewer operating fund, and the road operating fund. This change is proposed to adjust the budget for a 3% cost of living adjustment effective July 1st, 2022 for 12 and employees. When we put together the budget, we had prepared it with a split of that 3% into two parts. Uh, one and a half percent at July 1st and the other one and a half percent at January 1st, 2023. So we're moving that up to all be effective July 1. And so we're making some changes to the budget this evening for that. The last change is to the American Rescue Plan Act Fund. Uh, again, when we put together the budget uh, this spring, we had a placeholder in there for planned and potential uh, uses of the ARPA monies in the capital outlay category. Uh, we're proposing two additional categories be added to that budget this evening. Uh, the first is to create a personal services category for one-time premium pay payments to essential workers as defined by ARPA. And we're also proposing to create a mater uh, materials and services category to allow for expenditures in that category as you continue your discussions on the use of the ARPA funds in the coming months. Both of these changes are transfer of existing appropriations from one category to another with no increase in the funds total budget. With all these uh, proposed adjustments, uh, in addition to the approved budget budget committee, the total budget is $139,439,565. By adopting the, the attached resolution this evening, the city will be able to operate, expend money, and incur liabilities for fiscal year 2022, 2023, beginning on July 1st. Uh, that I'll be happy to answer any questions at the appropriate time, Mayor. All right, so at, at this time, I'm gonna ask anyone who uh, in the meeting would like to uh, testify in favor of the budget resolution. All right, any of those opposing the budget resolution? Anyone who'd like to just talk about their, <laughs> you're either again for it or would want to pass on your feelings about the budget resolution. All right, hearing none, now questions for Don. Councilor Pratt. I just wondered what the um, materials and services in the ARPA, what that would cover. Uh, it could be for, uh, consultants, if, if you, that type of thing, if you look to do, let's say, a utility billing assistance program, that would ideally go under that category. So there's a number of things that you've talked about or we've uh, mentioned in the past meetings. And so that would just create that category. I did throw some budget in there, but that would allow us to transfer additional monies in if needed throughout, throughout the year. Other questions for Don? All right, uh, 
seeing none, I'll go ahead and close the hearing and ask for beginning of deliberations. I'll go ahead and um, propose that we um, accept resolution number 5630-22, that we adopt resolution, excuse me, 5630-22. Uh, do we have to do a reading on this, Sherilyn, or adoption? Just an adoption? Okay. Yep. So a motion is second to adopt resolution number 5630-22. Any discussion on the motion? All right, Councilor Sacco. Aye. Councilor Hillier. Aye. Councilor Brooks. Aye. Councilor Reyes. Yes. Councilor Pratt. Aye. Councilor President Grimes. Aye. I vote aye also. The resolution is adopted unanimously. Uh, and stick around, Don. We'll be talking to you in a little bit. <laughs> I'll be here. All right. That brings us to general business uh, for consideration of recommendations from the city, the council committee on advisory appointments. Anyone have a summary for that? Council okay. Pratt. Yes, we we um, have recommendations for a person on the arts. Advisory committee, one person on the Twelton Planning Commission, and two people on the um, Twelton Parks Advisory Committee. Um, those people are for the Arts Advisory Committee. It's Don Upton. For the Planning Commission, it's Brittany Valley. For um, Arts Advisory Committee, it's John Makepeace. And our student for the Twelton Parks Advisory Committee, we'd like to recommend is Claire Roach. Very nice. So do I have a motion to accept the recommendation? I'll make a motion to accept the recommendations from the Council Committee on Advisory Appointments. Second. I have a motion and second to accept the recommendations. Any discussions? Councilor Sacco? Aye. Councilor Hillier? Aye. Councilor Brooks? Aye. Councilor Reyes? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Council Pratt. Aye. Council President Grimes. Aye. I vote aye also. Thank you. Uh, we had no items removed from consent uh, tonight. Uh, we were not able to do council communications at the end of work session, so we'll do that now. And I'll start with Councilor Sacco. Thank you. Um, <laughs> So I attended the WRWC where we reviewed the Willamette Basin reallocation and feasibility study. Um, so if anybody's interested in that, um, let me know. I also attended um, the CORA, which is um, the uh, what we're calling the, the, the core area tax increment financing um, proposal group. Um, and so we reviewed different areas um, of the proposal, talked about uh, possible plans. Um, and then I also attended the commercial CIO uh, meeting and um, where we did the same. And um, I was excited to go. And um, I know Kathy Holland was on earlier, but I don't see her on now, but thank you. Uh, for allowing me to attend the meeting because um, it was really interesting to just see the, um, the initial reactions um, of the commercial CIO. So I really appreciated being there um, as well. Um, I also attended the, um, the tolling diversion committee uh, meeting um, and uh, where we talked a, a lot about the same things that everybody is already um, fully aware of um, with that, um, with the tolling and diversion. Um, and we continue to meet monthly um, to continue those conversations. So thank you. Thank you. Councilor Hillier. Hi, thank you. Um, I did not, I have nothing to report. Okay, Councilor Brooks. Oh, thank you, Mayor. Um, <clears throat> Well, first of all, I wanted to thank, um, it was a pleasure to do the COIN interview for our B-City status and kick off Pollinator Week in such a fun, exciting way. It's not something I've done a lot of before. And all I have to say is that they made me look good. 
So it was really nice. Um, and let's see, I'm sorry. I thought I had, oh, I wanted to also um, send my, uh, my excitement around celebrating our first sort of official Juneteenth as an official holiday. And really want to mention, I read a wonderful article that was about how Juneteenth is not just for one community, but for all of us. And I heard, I didn't really think about it much, but then I heard a comment in the community and I really wanna point out that it is better for everybody that we don't live in a country, in my opinion, that has slavery. So um, that's something that is good for all of our community and to understand that I think it's really important. Um, and I, also want to mention that I attended a couple, I attended three different classes that were done, two for pollinator week and one uh, about master recycling through the Juanita Pole Center last week. And we, the, one of them was about um, bees and maintaining mason bees. It was so full that we could have almost used a bigger classroom um, and the master recycling class was really good. Um, I learned a lot and I feel like I've gone through trainings on this before. So Sharon did that. She did a great job and creating habitat where you live was about the backyard habitat program, which is just a very interesting um, program. And I keep um, learning more and more about it and want to do it. So I just want to thank the leadership over there and the Earthwise programming um, it's really um, good. And I encourage other people to join in. Actually, this week, I'm going to be going on the recycling tour. We're actually going to Wilsonville and checking out Republic's recycling um, place. We have to be safe. And that's just a reminder, one little thing of not keeping caps on bottles that you put in the recycle because they can fly, be projectiles and hurt people that are actually working in the plant. So there's so many different little nuances and things to learn about as things are always changing around this issue. I also went to the Twelton Arts Advisory Committee and um, just want, it's just such a great group and they um, passed and made recommendations for the grants that the committee gives out. I had not seen them for a little while um, because I'm on vacation. And so it was great to also celebrate getting the fourth wall painted at the park and the beautiful wraps that they worked on throughout the community. And just wanna thank them again for their great work and also wanted to congratulate, well, thank every applicant that applied for our um, volunteer fees. It's always a pleasure to meet everyone and we always wanna appoint everyone and um, congratulate those that we did appoint and encourage the others to continue to apply um, for other positions. And that's all I've got, thank you. Thank you. Council Reyes. Uh, nothing to report, uh, Mayor, so, okay. but um, thank you. Happy okay. fourth. <laughs> Council Pratt. I have nothing to report. I right after our last council meeting, I got a bad case of COVID, so I kind of missed out a week or so of life. <laughs> but, and I think we have a rock star uh, Bates running the show tonight with COVID. So, I just want to remind everybody to um, just be careful. It's you know it's still out there and it, it's a pretty hard. So, yeah. All right, Council President Grimes. Well, gosh, I am so sorry that you guys have been sick and I am glad to see you up and around. I know it seems like at work, we're starting to get an email a day about people that are coming down with COVID. So I'm, I'm so sorry that you were sick and I'm glad you guys are back. Um, I haven't had a meeting since our last meeting, but we have an ARB meeting um, coming up this Wednesday. So um, I'll report back on that after we have it. And I was happy, I think I mentioned this last uh, city council meeting where we were talking about the ARB meeting and we had been looking over the SEPA uh, development that's coming. 
And I was really pleased tonight when we were having the um, sound engineer was giving his report and he kind of uh, called out the seabed development specifically as being very smart about the way that they had laid out their development to mitigate the sound and the whole traffic interference that would come off of Boone's Ferry. I thought it was really nice of them to mention that because I think that as I said before, the developers of that um, particular um, complex, I think were very smart about how they laid it out, how they used berms, how they used plantings to really try to make the most of the location and make the least of traffic um, and noise that could Boone's Ferry. So um, that's about it for me. All right. Um... Back on June so long ago, June the uh, 14th, uh, I, along with Jonathan Taylor of our economic development team, we attended the GPI event celebrating the resumption of international flights in and out of PX. Uh, Delta and Alaska Airlines had representatives answering questions on how things are going to roll out, new routes, how to do how to new that, how do new routes get selected pilot shortage. It was a terrific uh, evening, about a couple hours of uh, getting our answers questioned and uh, finding what uh, PDX, the airport, Port of Portland, is looking at as far as terms of expanding uh, service. Uh, one of the things they're eyeing is, you know, direct flights to Mexico City. Uh, there's talk of more to Japan because the Japan flights never materialized because of COVID. So we're going to hear more to come from the Port of Portland folks there. On the 20th, the five mayors lunch was held. Uh, and uh, no surprise here, the major talk of the five mayors here in the area was about MSTIP and about the projects we submitted. Just discussing each project and going over um, how it impact our communities. Uh, then I had another meet, more meetings on the 22nd. Uh, one had a nice coffee with uh, Metro Council Rosenthal for about an hour and a half catching up on some items uh, of concern at you know his level of Metro wanting to hear what we're hearing as counselors and as mayor. And then of course, you know, what's going on beyond Metro's um, purview, but he, you know, he went especially in Washington County because he is very interested in that. Then later that day, we had the Metro Mayor's Consortium Economic Development and Workforce Development Subcommittee, subcommittee meeting. Uh, focusing on the importance of what we're going to look at at the next legislative uh, session and that being um, the importance of daycare and the lack of daycare. How the three counties are in a daycare desert. Uh, what can we do, one, to um, make it more affordable? But how do we build out the infrastructure for it? What has to happen to have daycare centers open so folks can get their children into daycare? Um, because the example was given uh, in Portland, actually in Multnomah County, you know, they've had that measure to pay for uh, preschool and the struggle people are having is they can't take their vouchers anywhere because all the places are full, you know, and uh, um, mayor, um, who was it, one of the mayors, <laughs> blank spot, one of the mayors were saying, oh, it was Mayor Galloway, says we've got to change our thinking and value daycare workers. And the importance of daycare because we're taking care of our kids we're taking care of our future and right now we really don't you know it's minimum wage jobs that a lot of people really don't want so we got to somehow elevate um, the importance of that plus make it more available to folks so they can get back to work rather than staying at home because we all have examples of it's cheaper for the second spouse to stay home rather than go to work because daycare is too much um on the 23rd attempt uh the Twalton Chamber of Commerce has changed its board meeting. It's now 7.30 in the morning. <laughs> so we made that adjustment. Uh, and the June MMC, the regular full meeting was held and spent a quite a bit of time discussing Measure 110 um, and the poor rollout of Measure 110 from the state uh, and how the public service agencies that are supposed to support those folks uh, to go into rehab and make this drug reduction program work are just finally getting funds that OHA is so far behind in rolling this out um, that uh, a lot of the communities are seeing uh, police officers were super discouraged 
that they won't ticket someone because they're feeling it doesn't happen, uh, nothing happens to them, or that uh, no one's really going to rehab. And they've, you know, they're going to work better with the state to get this rolled out better. Um, they're going to be working uh, hand and fist, if you will, hand and glove with the local police departments because they know that's the most important point of contact. And, uh, you know, find out what the struggles are and make those resources available because we're really good at finding resources for folks who are experiencing homelessness or are experiencing, hung experiencing hunger right now as far as drug treatment. We're dropping the ball and 110 was supposed to help with this and uh, we got to fix that. And then we went to the other next uh, tough subject, which was the uh, Metro is shopping their parks levy renewal and talking about the parks levy renewal being on the November ballot. Um, and I, you know, Mayor Snyder picked on me first and said, uh, Mayor Bubenek, why don't you tell how much you love the Metro Parks program? <laughs> and so we talked about, you know, Stone Ridge and the park and a lot of good stuff. Um, and my ask for, okay, you know, in order for uh, Metro Parks bond renewals, let's all have the same common definition of what a park is and not be surprised. Your definition of a park is diff you know, different than what our parks are going to think. So uh, I think Metro heard, you know, heard they're going to move on uh, with some of our advice because, you know, most of the mayors were uh, semi-supportive, but not seeing a lot of communication going back and forth between Metro and the cities as far as the levy and uh, where the money is going to go. And I finished the day off with uh, Chair Harrington's Washington County Chair Mayor meeting. Uh, as I sent you the email, the big subject of her discussion was the rollout of uh, you know the availability of uh, psilocybin and treatment facilities and growing facilities. Uh, folks can start applying in January of next year. And the stance that Washington County has that they don't have the time to deal with this right now. Uh, so they're going to put a two-year moratorium or maybe a moratorium on it in uh, Washington County because they just don't have the time to deal with land use ruling. So I just wanted to you know, fly that by folks because if you're going to make any changes to the psilocybin as far as a locality, you have to do it during a general election. So it's only two years. Most of the mayors did not feel it was going to be an issue in their cities because it's so difficult, as Council Brooks said, to get one of these up and running. Um, but I think because the county deals with a lot of, of course, unincorporated Washington County, be way more difficult for them to handle than it would for us if something was to happen. Uh, but I want to make sure you were aware that, uh, you know, and again, OHA is behind on rolling this out uh, because of COVID, but that, you know, this is part of measure, was it 109? It was 109 and 110 uh, that this is coming. I don't foresee it being a big issue here in Tualatin, but you know, we want to keep our ears to the ground if we think, you know, if it does become an issue. Um, on the 24th, did a ribbon cutting for the chamber at Envision Golf. That is where Boom Fitness used to be. Uh, so it's one of those interior golfing simulator uh, businesses. And it's pretty nice in there. If you have a chance, pop in there. They've got a full restaurant. They've got a bar. Um, and if you want to learn golf, they'll teach you how to play golf. And what's, it's going to be one of the cheapest places you can play golf because you rent by the bay and it's 60 bucks for a bay and up to six players. And you can play St. Andrews in you know Scotland for 60 bucks with six of your friends. <laughs> so I uh, hope they do well. I think they're in a great spot and uh, golf is taking off in, uh, uh, you know, people are really liking golf and this has got the advantage of it's, you know, totally crappy out. You can still golf, just go indoors and do it. <laughs> And finally, uh, today was the uh, Washington County Coordinating Committee had an additional meeting because the 2023 Metro uh, Regional Transportation Plan is being reviewed. Uh, so today's subject was uh, the lack of transit availability. So how can we do a regional transportation plan when Metro is cutting routes? Um, the Metro person got beat up pretty good this morning. Um, because many cities weren't uh, advised about Metro service cancellations that was in the Oregonian this weekend. Beaverton had no idea they were gonna lose two bus routes. Um, so the question was, how did this go through? Was there any public input? 
uh, because this was ruled an emergency, there was no public input. Uh, the board of TriMet just decided based on advice what routes to cancel. So there's discussion of, okay, you know, we were okay with service reductions, but we're not okay with service total, you know, service cancellations. Um, so how do we build, uh, get people out of their cars, moving through the area if, you know, there's no bus service and the lack of bus service in Washington County and the severe lack of availability in Clackamas County. Um, so at JPAC, our uh, Commissioner Fai, Mayor uh, Dillon and Mayor Calway will be uh, speaking to Metro and to TriMet. And TriMet realizes uh, that right now they're not hitting their marks. They have a severe driver shortage, um, as does Smart down in Wilsonville. But we've got to figure out, you know, if we're going to have a regional transportation plan, there has to be alternative routes of transportation. And it feeds into our climate friendly problem, too, that everyone's saying, oh, get out of your car, get in the bus, but there's no consistent service available to us here in Tualatin, um, and it's even worse out in Sherwood. Um, and think that's it. So any other questions for me? Councilor Grimes. Thank you. Um, it's concerning to hear that the MMC is saying that um, people in the police are having a difficult time with measure 110. And I was wondering if um, Chief Pickering wanted to maybe weigh in. I'm just curious if our officers are having concerns or hesitation, you know, centered around that measure, if that's something that's impacting our guys and girls and women and men. I didn't Chief. say that right. Yeah, the 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 unfortunate side of Measure 110 right now is that there's not a lot of follow through after the issuance of the citation. Um, okay. <clears throat> I think, if I'm not mistaken, the last I had heard, there was uh, very few citations issued in Washington County, mm -hmm. and it was roughly about 10% um, that were that had any type of follow through um, after the issuance of the citation itself. So. Um, it's not widely used right now because there's just not, um, after the citations issued, there's not much that happens after that because the, the systems just aren't in place, uh, or they're not ready to go at this point. So, um, I, I would agree that it's, um, it's not been implemented fully. Uh, and at this point there's, there's just not a lot to it. I, I think I must be a little bit more ignorant about this than I thought that I was. So when you say there's not a lot of follow through, do you mean the person that receives the citation doesn't do what they're supposed to do? Or is it that at the point where they go before the judge or whatever, there's not any kind of diversionary option? When you say there's no follow through, can you elaborate on that a little sure, more specifically? Sure. So, so as of right now, uh, if, if an officer comes into contact with somebody who is in possession of, of a controlled substance uh, under the, the, the ORS now and, and the changes in the ORS based, based upon ballot measure 110. Um, they're issued a citation right. $100. Um, if they don't show to their court date, uh, there's no follow through. Um, the, the way that the law is written, there's actually nothing that's done. There's no follow up back up with um, the, the person that was issued the citation. Um, there's no mechanism in place to actually do that through the court system. Um, they're provided uh, right now. They're provided a business card that has a phone number for them to call uh, the resource uh, for the, the drug assessment. Um, and after that, the, what's pretty much out of our our hands at that point. So we issue the citation. We provide the information on they, they do get a date um, and and what they have to do um, if they don't show up to court. There's not a lot. Of, again, the idea behind that uh, ballot measure 110 is to to encourage the drug treatment. Right, and right, right, right. the the unfortunate side of the of where we're at throughout the entire state um, is that there doesn't appear to be the mechanisms and the things in place to assist with the treatment side or the assessment side after the citation issue. So our officers will interact with with the, the community member. Um, we issue the citation. Uh, you know, we'll, we will uh, the narcotics and and for destruction or for evidentiary purposes and they're issued a citation and then they're they're off into the system and, and 
The unfortunate side is that the backside of that system isn't as robust as we'd hoped it to be at this point. If exactly. someone um, isn't following through with what they're supposed to do and they, let's say they come into a situation where they're looking at a second citation, is there any escalation of the level of the charge or is it just they get a citation to do with as is? Because I, 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 I guess I, I'm not as familiar with the penalty side of that measure other than I knew that the goal was to get people into some sort of a diversion drug treatment. I got that part, but I'm not really sure about like the level of severity of these tickets. And if you keep getting them and not doing anything, does that put a person in jeopardy of actually doing jail time or? No. Um, okay. Well, potentially. Uh, the, the, way, the way that it's set up right now, so it's a class E violation. Uh, okay. So a class E violation, uh, for some perspective, um, if you were to look at the level of a, of a, a violation, uh, a uh, running a red light is a class uh, B violation or class C violation. And uh, possession of a controlled substance under ballot measure 110 is a, is a level E. So it's farther down. So it's punishable by $100. The, the way that the system is set up, um, to the best of my understanding, is that if, if you don't show up for court or you don't make that phone call for treatment or assessment, there is no penalty brought upon you because, the, again, they don't want to continue to compound on people who may not have the resources they need. And the idea behind the ballot measure is to get people the resources and the help that they need. And so the, right, right, the, right. the way that the law is actually written is it, it doesn't compound on itself. If I remember correctly, after the third violation where they would get their third citation, um, it would be handled as it would be normally. So it would be, if they're in possession of, of a, you know, schedule one or schedule two narcotic, it would be handled as a misdemeanor and it would be to the district attorney's office. So it's, again, the, the idea behind the measure is a, is a um, it, it is, it's a good idea. The unfortunate side is right now that the back end after the citation is issued um, hasn't caught up to where we need it to be. If that makes sense. The, the, the yeah, struggle no, with does. OHA didn't get the money out to the groups that were going to do the rehab and do the, uh, you know, do the interception, do the intake, and it's just getting out there now. So it's been basically two years in delay. Sort of um, and so uh, police have been citing people. And if they do call, it was hit or miss if someone answered the phone. Uh, so they're trying to set up this, like they said, they've got multiple agencies. Each county now is going to have a series of agencies that will handle the call now. It's just it's just way behind, like Captain Pickering. I'm sorry, Chief Pickering is saying it's this this rolled out and the system wasn't ready yet. How many tickets have we given? Do you have a ballpark? I, not very many. Yeah, I, I would say I, I can't give you a good number. I want to say the last that I had heard. Um, countywide in, the, in, the, in Washington County, it was under a hundred. It was not very many. So, because there's, there's just, there's no, there's, no point. there's nothing to it. And so the, the officers are almost feeling, you know, countywide, because this, this has been discussed at, at, at our mm -hmm. command level meetings and executive level meetings throughout law enforcement in Washington County is that it's almost, you know, we, we don't want to be handing out these hundred dollar tickets that go nowhere versus you know, again, trying to get people help through whatever services that we can find and we can find available um, you know, trying to, to try to mitigate the situation the best we can. Well, thank you. I really appreciate you answering all my questions. I sure. learned a lot I, from that. Thank you. Why MMC brought it up because this, I uh, mean, the Oregonian had a terrific op-ed and they had an article about this and the frustration across the state as uh, Chief Pickering is saying is that you know, it's and OHA is finally taking responsibility for it, but um, it's you know these folks need help and the, the systems aren't there yet. I see Councilor Brooks has her hand up. Yeah, I mean, and and the reasoning too of all the the stopping of funds is complex, but I just am curious if they had a timeline as far as when. They will get the money out. 
Are you frozen? Nope. No. <laughs> Despite my background, uh, no, they're getting it out now. The question is, and this is where I get a little fuzzy. This was a three-year project, and it should be up for refunding. I think next legislative cycle, and will the legislature fund it again when they're so far behind and they've got the negative opinion of the average resident in, in the state of Oregon? has a very negative opinion polling wise on the impacts of the measure versus what they were told, what it would do. Like Captain, uh, she's chief picker and saying the goal is great. It's just, they've, they've screwed up the plan, the execution. Yeah, no, I understand. It's, they had a lot of trouble getting the funding out. Know, um, and I also know that there's a lot of shorts around our state is not robust in behavioral health workers because we have no systems in place. So I hope that they get it out in a meaningful way so that people can get some help. So, so if this isn't refunded next legislative session, do we just have these people you're giving citations and they're not getting the services they need? Yeah, we'll see. <laughs> I mean, that, that's why, I mean, that's why we're all, it's, uh, what, it's, it seems far away. But that's why MMC is developing their legislative legislative agenda, so we're ready to go when they open the next long session. Well, and in the meantime, the cities are they've divert one ten diverted the marijuana money uh, to for that, and so we're down seventy percent of what we were getting, and and yet the money is they're having a hard time like. Um, getting the money out for this. And I know that there's a lot of reasons behind it, but in the meantime, nobody's getting the money. It's starting, like I said, it's starting to trickle out. They're starting to get their act together. They're just way behind. They should have been the, as one mayor pointed out, shouldn't you had this program laid out before um, you put it on the ballot and had the mechanisms ready to go. But COVID hit and has thrown OHA, you know, into disarray. Council Hillier. I do want to just note that Measure 10 was referred to the ballot by signature. It wasn't something that had been vetted through the legislature first to make sure that all those mechanisms and levers were in place. So what the Oregonians passed is exactly what we got because it, it hadn't been vetted first. So, and there is a lot of money right now going into treatment centers. It's just not being connected. I mean, they have a robust leadership um, group with Measure 110. There are an awful lot of things happening with it, but it is, um, it, a lot had to be vetted through the legislature because it wasn't legal the way we passed it. I mean, we passed it by voting, but the measure itself was not legal. So I just want to point that out. That's a good point. All right. All right. So everybody okay with me closing this meeting and starting our next one? All right, I'll go ahead and adjourn the city council meeting and bring to order the June 27, 2022 12th and Development Commission meeting. All right. So at this point, doesn't seem like there's very much people left in this meeting, but this is an opportunity for anyone in the public to discuss or talk about anything that's not on our agenda tonight. Please limit your comments to three minutes. Do we have every, anyone who would like to make public comment tonight at our TDC meeting? All right, seeing none, I'll move on to the consent agenda. Uh, the consent agenda will be enacted by one vote. These items are considered routine. Uh, the consent agenda is a consent agenda Items can be removed from the uh, consent agenda and heard later tonight. Uh, are any questions on this one item on the consent agenda? All right. Uh, do I have a motion? Motion we um, accept the consent agenda is read. I'll second then. All right. So I have a motion and second for consideration of uh, adopting the consent agenda. At, I didn't even read it, did I? <laughs> I just realized oh. that uh, the items on our consent agenda is item number one, consideration for approval of the 12th Development Commission meeting minutes of January 24th, 2022. So I adopt the consent agenda is read. 
I continue to second. All right. Uh, I have a motion and a second to adopt the consent agenda as read finally. Any discussion on those motions? Uh, Commissioner Hillier. Aye. Commissioner Brooks. Aye. Commissioner Grimes. Aye. Commissioner Pratt. Aye. Commissioner Reyes. Yes. Commissioner Sacco. Aye. And I vote aye also. That brings us to our public hearing. Uh, and I'm going to head, go ahead and open up the public hearing for the TDC uh, consideration of resolution number 632-22, adopting the 12th and Development Commission budget and making appropriations for the fiscal year commencing July 1st, 2022. Mr. Hudson, you're back on. Yes, I took a little trip, but I'm back. <laughs> and I, I keep having this thing back on, at least I turned the light off. It looked like I had this bright idea going on and we all know how that goes. Uh, the, the, if the hearing is op open, I will give you my staff report. It is open. Great. I missed that part, so I thought I better double check. <laughs> uh, so you, you have in front of you this evening resolution 632-22, which will adopt the TDC commission budget uh, for the, to the fiscal year commencing July 1st. Statutes require the commission adopt the budget prior to July 1st, 2022, and the 12th and Budget Advisory Committee approved the budget back on May 31st. There are no proposed changes to the committee approved budget this evening. The total commission budget is $3,764,840 and is comprised of budgets in three funds, the 12th and Development Commission Administration Fund, the Leviton Projects Fund, and the new Southwest Urban Renewal District Bond Fund. By adopting the attached resolution, the commission will be able to operate, expend money, and incur liabilities for fiscal year 2022-2023, beginning on July 1st. That, I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have. So I'm going to go ahead and open the floor to anyone who's present at the meeting at this point to either speak in favor, in opposition, or just register interest in this budget item and this resolution. All right, uh, with that, questions from council. All right, if there's no questions, I'll go ahead and close the hearing and ask for beginning of deliberations on uh, resolution 632-22. Well. <laughs> go for it, Nancy. <laughs> All right, well, I was just gonna say, Hearing no deliberations, I'll go ahead and make a motion for adoption of resolution number 632-22, adopting the Twalton Development Commission budget, making appropriations, fiscal year commencing first day of July, 2022. Second. I have a motion and a second to adopt resolution 632-22, adopting the Twalton Development Commission budget, and making appropriations for the fiscal year commencing July 1st, 2022. Any discussion on those motions? All right, Commissioner Hillier. Aye. Commissioner Brooks. Aye. Commissioner Grimes. Aye. Commissioner Pratt. Aye. Commissioner Reyes. Yes. Commissioner Sacco. Aye. And I vote aye also, it's unanimous. Congratulations, Don. Thank you. All right. Uh, we don't have round table here, so I'll just move for uh, a motion for adjournment. Aye. All right, We've got a motion second to uh, adjourn our TDC meeting of June 27th. All those in favor, just raise your hand. Both opposed. All right, good night and uh, looking forward to the heat dissipating tomorrow. Have a good evening. <laughs>